Good morning, everybody. I hope that um, you can hear me. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to uh, speak about um, the situation in uh, in Libya and um, in more generally uh, a little bit how this is affecting uh, both the Mediterranean, uh, but also uh, what the situation is like for movements into Libya from uh, mostly the south. And uh, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on um, our interventions and what we're doing uh, in this uh, in this uh, context. So uh, I'm not sure how to change the slide here. Maybe if I could get some assistance and go into the next slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is just a very quick overview of uh, the situation uh, in Libya right now. You can see uh, in the top left corner uh, our estimate of uh, about 600,000 uh, migrants, just, uh, just under 600,000 migrants that are uh, currently in Libya. This is from uh, IOM uh, DTM uh, uh, program that collects uh, wide range of uh, data on uh, migration and uh, mobility. And uh, what you can also see here, which is extremely important, is that um, the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, right bar charts uh, indicate some of the main uh, nationalities. And you'll notice uh, right away that um, with Niger, Egypt, Sudan, and Chad, uh, which are all bordering countries of, uh, of Libya, uh, we can account for uh, just about 70% uh, of the migrants uh, in the country. Now, this is uh, very important because, uh, first of all, these uh, movements uh, of these nationalities into Libya are uh, historic. Uh, they're very, uh, they're very uh, natural in a way, in the sense that they've been happening for a long time. Uh, over uh, over the um, porous uh, borders, uh, and um, you know, generally, it's uh, economic uh, migration, uh, and most of these nationalities are concentrated also uh, qu quite close to the borders uh, to their own uh, to their own country. Now, the other very important aspect of uh, this uh, this group of, of migrants is that uh, for the most part they're not nationalities that uh, attempt to cross uh, the Mediterranean. They're not nationalities that uh, are registered in uh, in large numbers in uh, in uh, in Europe, in Malta, or in Italy, where where uh, they are uh, usually arrive. And they're also not nationalities that we see in large numbers in uh, detention centers, which I think perhaps my colleague, uh, Georgette Gagnon, spoke a little bit about uh, yesterday about the situation surrounding the detention centers. So um, these are uh, basically economic migrants. Um, they're, they, they do face uh, challenges and difficulties, but they're not under uh, a, lo a lot of pressure to uh, escape or move uh, in a northerly direction uh, towards Europe. They tend to have the ability to return relatively easily uh, to, uh, to their own countries. And so you can see right away that, um, you know, if we um, exclude this as, um, you know, a, a problematic, if I can use that word, um, problematic types of migration uh, in terms of the irregularity, in terms of the connections with um, the smuggling, the trafficking, and so on. Uh, in fact, we have uh, you know a very uh, st still a big number, but very a very manageable number of uh, of migrants, uh, which are predominantly the the rest are predominantly from uh, West African countries and uh, a smaller number from uh, East African countries, in particular uh, Somalia, some Eritreans, and, um, and um, that's 
that's effectively the the, the bulk of the um, of the uh, migrant stock in terms of the representation. You can also see that uh, men are um, very very highly uh, represented. Uh, we have uh, over well about eighty percent uh, about eighty percent men, about ten percent women, and the rest uh, children. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we have context in the, uh, around the world where um, the male-female breakdown in countries is uh, close to 50%, or sometimes uh, women may even be one or, or two points uh, higher. Uh, but in Libya, we have uh, predominantly a migration of um, adult male. Now, what's important about that demographic number or uh, picture is that um, this is not a static situation. So what I'm describing to you now is the current uh, composition of the migrants in Libya. But um, a few years ago, 2015, 16, 17, um, we would have seen uh, probably a lot, a lot higher uh, percentage of women um, many of whom were at risk of being trafficked, many of whom uh, were uh, from uh, Nigeria, which is particularly uh, at, which is a which is a group that's particularly at risk of uh, of trafficking. And we were also seeing uh, basically these uh, numbers and this kind of breakdown in terms of the gender breakdown reflected in uh, the arrivals in uh, in Europe at the time. So um, this is the situation now. And uh, indeed, um, you know, uh, some of those issues uh, related uh, specifically to trafficking for um, sexual exploitation are are still extremely challenges, challenging and and still and still um, part of uh, the issues that we're trying to uh, to to tackle. Uh, but uh, I would say that pr it's probably not as um, substantial in terms of numbers as uh, as it was uh, was some uh, years ago. Um, now, the other uh, two other I think important takeaways from this uh, slide. But the first is that um, if we look at Libya uh, pre two thousand eleven, so pre revolution. Uh, basically, when it had a fully functioning uh, economy, uh, the estimates, the IOM estimates at the time were about 1.5 million migrants in the country. And uh, some of the government estimates were even higher, um, even around 2 million. So um, we're at far, far lower numbers now. And uh, this is obviously an indication of the instability, the insecurity. Uh, and the fact that um, the economy is, is far from, uh, you know, what it was. Um, but what that tells us is that uh, Libya has a tremendous capacity to uh, absorb uh, migrant labor. And in fact, it has uh, a labor market that's structured in a way that requires migrant labor. And the other important uh, aspect, uh, which is much more um, current, is the fact that we've seen an important reduction in the number of migrants in Libya since the middle of 2020 when COVID uh, reached uh, the country. So um, about uh, 15 months ago, we would have been looking at a slide that would have had uh, probably about 680,000 migrants uh, in Libya. We've gone down uh, to uh, we've gone down to um, even lower than this 597 by a little bit, uh, and now it's uh, it's starting. It might be starting to come back up. It's a trend that we're we're watching. But basically, uh, the COVID uh, the COVID uh, pandemic um, slowed down the uh, economy as it did as it has uh, around the world. The lockdowns were very hard on migrants in particular who rely on daily wages. And, uh, you know, if they can't work every day uh, out uh, wherever they are, then uh, they immediately feel the economic impact. And um, my 
my theory uh, untested, but uh, uh, I'm pretty sh- sure of it, is that um, a lot of these people uh, were indeed from the neighboring countries, uh, Egypt uh, and Niger uh, in particular, and uh, basically uh, returned home on their own overland uh, when things got uh, got difficult uh, in Libya. So uh, we can see that uh, even in a in a con- in a context um, as difficult uh, as Libya, as both with the conflict and the pandemic, um, the uh, the mi- the migration uh, numbers. Uh, indicate a, uh, a a reaction and and uh, you know um, basically this trend of of uh, of uh, people returning uh, home um, when things uh, got difficult in uh, in the country, both health wise and work wise. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just um, to make sure that um, you know what I've uh, just described is uh, can be visualized a little bit better and is is uh, is, is clear to everybody. Um, you see, um, obviously, the map of Libya, some of the main routes, um, which are um, the main route uh, from the uh, east uh, is um, that's the group, that's the nationalities, not just Sudan, but also the nationalities that I mentioned from uh, the Horn of Africa coming who primarily come up through uh, uh, Sudan into uh, into southeastern uh, Libya. That part of the country is a very, very difficult uh, and isolated area for us to work in. Uh, and then in the south uh, west, um, primarily um, coming in from uh, Niger. This is the route that's most commonly used by the West African nationals uh, and uh, the Nigerians uh, as well. Um, Egyptians are mostly moving uh, in the north, uh, in the northeast, uh, in areas uh, along uh, along the coastline, and uh, <clears throat> you can see that. Um, there is uh, an important representation of North African uh, nationals in uh, in uh, Libya, primarily uh, Tunisians and uh, Egyptians, and then uh, the Sub-Saharan Africans, uh, including, of course, uh, the Chad and the Nigerian and the, uh, and the Sudanese that I mentioned, uh, make up just over half. And then we have uh, a small, uh, a small, smaller representations from other Middle Eastern countries and uh, and Asia, Asia being uh, primarily uh, Bangladesh, uh, the Philippines, and uh, to some extent uh, Pakistan as well. Next slide, please. Now this is um, just a, a historical view of. Um, the Mediterranean um, uh, fatalities, uh, dead or missing migrants uh, in the central, uh, well, in all of the Mediterranean, but um, uh, focusing in on the on the central Mediterranean, you can see how uh, comparatively uh, speaking this year, for example, because uh, this 1,195 uh, is the number for uh, uh, so far 2021. Uh, and you can see how much uh, higher the um, death, death or missing uh, numbers are than the Eastern or the Western uh, Mediterranean. I think probably many of you know that we've had a, an important uh, increase in, in level of activity in the Western Mediterranean um, towards, uh, towards uh, Spain. And uh, and that's uh, quite a dangerous uh, route as well, particularly along the uh, Atlantic. Um, and you can you can see that despite this increase uh, in the Western Mediterranean, still the Central Mediterranean is far far more uh, dangerous. Um, you can also see historically that um, while the one thousand one hundred ninety five is um, certainly not one of the tallest uh, bars uh, compared to 
2015, 16, or 17, we have to put this into context uh, because uh, during uh, those years, uh, particularly 15, 16, and, uh, and 2017, we had very, very substantial uh, numbers of uh, crossings and arrivals uh, to Europe. Um, you know, on, on, on average, those years, uh, we were sometimes uh, 170, 180,000 uh, arrivals per year. Um, and I think for uh, maybe 2017, we were a little bit lower, but still uh, probably around 130,000 people arrived. So, in fact, while we have lower numbers of crossings, um, the uh, risk uh, and the number of people dying and missing uh, is uh, is uh, alarmingly uh, alarmingly high. This is, of course, due to um, the absence of a of a state led uh, search and rescue operation in the central Mediterranean. Uh, we have uh, very few. Uh, uh, vessels operating, uh, carrying out res uh, rescues of uh, boats in distress. Now, um, what has happened, uh, what has also evolved um, over the last uh, three years in particular, so really <clears throat> since uh, about 2019, is that the Libyan Coast Guard um, has been a lot more active in uh, conducting um, <clears throat> rescue operations and uh, bringing people back to uh, to Libya. So um, now that's uh, important because um, they're they've really uh, increased the number of uh, people that um, they are they are uh, picking up at sea and uh, taking back to the country. We went from basically um, no capacity uh, a few years ago um, to uh, this year already um, over 22,000 people that have been um, picked up by the, uh, by, the Libyan, uh, by the Libyan Coast Guard and taken back uh, to Libya. Um, if I could, if you could put on the next slide, please. And so um, this is a little. This is a snapshot of the situ of uh, this uh, aspect of the um, of the departures uh, from Libya, and um, you can see that um, in all of 2020, we were just under 12,000 uh, people returned to Libya, and so far in 2021, we're already over 22,000. I suspect that. Uh, we will get to 30,000 uh, quite easily and probably uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a number at the end of the year somewhere between 30 and 35,000 uh, people. Now, um, this is, I'll get into um, some of those issues in, in a moment, but um, What's very important when we're looking at the situation in the central Mediterranean is, you know, the tendency, um, certainly from the European side, uh, the tendency is to look at the, the data that's uh, most easily available, which is usually the number of people that have arrived uh, and that have been, you know, registered by by primarily Italy and, and to some extent Malta in Europe, and to use this number as uh, you know the main indicator. And of course, uh, from the perspective of um, from from the simple perspective of you know uh, as a number of people going uh, up or down, arriving, going up or down, that's uh, a very effective way to to analyze the situation. But if we really want to under, try to understand what the migration dynamics are, uh, and if we really want to try to understand uh, what is happening uh, in this corridor, um, we have to look at not just the number of people that succeed uh, in uh, crossing the Mediterranean, 
but uh, also the number of people that uh, attempt and uh, don't succeed. I think this is a much clearer uh, and more complete, not just the more complete picture, but it's a much clearer indicator, a much stronger indicator of what the situation is uh, in, in Libya in terms of, uh, Libya as, uh, you know, either the situation in Libya as a push factor or in terms of, uh, Libya as, uh, um, you know, a, a transit country or a, a point of departure for, for, uh, for some people. So if we do that for two, for 2021, if we look at, the numbers um, that have been registered so far in in uh, in, in Italy, um, we are at already about thirty two thousand people. Now, uh, a good percentage of those is going to be from uh, Tunisia. So we have to exclude probably uh, as much as half of that. Um, but still, even if we're working with just 15 or 16,000, uh, having successfully made the crossing for Libya, it means that so far in 2021, uh, together with those that have been taken back by the Libyan coast guard, we are, um, uh, somewhere probably between 35 and 40,000 people that have attempted to, that have attempted or have succeeded to, uh, across the Mediterranean. And that is, um, uh, I think it's an important number and it's an increase um, certainly over last year. Um, And I think there's two main reasons for this. Um, The one one is um, with the criminality uh, in Libya, uh, the smugglers, the traffickers that have the space uh, to operate. Um, And um, perhaps... uh, Perhaps more uh, space and, and a greater ability to uh, to uh, operate than uh, when there is uh, active conflict or uh, or more instability. And the second, I, the second contributing factor um, is uh, is probably the conditions uh, in Libya uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the working conditions, in terms of the living conditions, in terms also. Uh, when it comes to uh, the pandemic, uh, the the uh, access to health services and the and the COVID risks, because Libya is also a country that's um, really uh, that's been really struggling to uh, to get a handle on uh, on COVID, understandably, with uh, a health system that um, uh, basically has been uh, has been neglected for uh, neglected and in some cases even targeted during the conflict for uh for for 10 years now so um i think this is an important number to keep uh to 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 keep an eye on uh that cumulative number the number of attempts uh to to leave and people coming back and the numbers uh that we have in in europe in terms of those that actually uh just that actually succeed um and unfortunately um we'll know we'll have a better idea uh you know towards the end of this year but unfortunately i think 2021 uh will show that uh that trend is going in uh the wrong uh, the wrong direction um you'll see that um you know what i described earlier in terms of the breakdown of um in terms of the gender breakdown um you'll see that you see that again you know, predominantly men. Um, The gender breakdown before was uh, the stock, uh, the number of people in Libya. This is the gender breakdown of those that have been uh, rescued or intercepted and taken back. But uh, it pretty much reflects um, that uh, same uh, reality. Now, um, when these people are taken back to, to Libya, when they're picked up at sea and taken back, um, the, the vast majority of them um, go into uh, detention uh, centers. And uh, we're now in a situation in the country where uh, we have uh, about 6,000 people uh, in, uh, in detention. Um, 
And uh, at the beginning of the year, there were about uh, 2,800. So we've had an increase of uh, several thousand. Uh, but what I have a difficulty uh, trying to analyze and understand is how it's possible that 22,000 people have been taken back to Libya. Uh, the majority were transferred from the uh, disembarkment points to the detention centers. And yet uh, the number uh, of people in detention is only just, uh, you know, double uh, 2,800, let's say. Um, so we have uh, people that are being uh, transferred into detention centers and then uh, are unaccounted for. They are uh, they they effectively disappear from uh, from from the data that uh, is otherwise uh, quite well uh, tracked. Um, that number this year is uh, probably about fifteen thousand people that um, went into detention and uh, are now um, let's say unaccounted for. Um, and it's um, something that um, is very concerning to me because um, most of them uh, have not been released, uh, but uh, have, have uh, somehow uh, in other ways uh, been transferred out of these uh, out of these structures. And uh, I think um, I think uh, Georgette Gagnon spent a little bit more time on the on the detention systems, but. Um, we very much share this uh, concern uh, uh, in all of the all of the across the UN uh, in terms of uh, the lack of accountability that um, there is for the detention system, and of course, this is all tied into um, the fact that uh, you know Libya uh, cannot be considered a safe place uh, as long as uh, people are are. Uh, are um, going uh, missing from uh, the custody of, uh, of the authorities and also uh, as long as the conditions that uh, exist uh, in these detention centers uh, persist. Next slide, please. Um, very quickly, just um, it's not um, it's not specifically related to uh, either international migration or um, the Mediterranean, but um, we are we also work on a very the a very important issue of uh, internally displaced uh, Libyans in Libya. And um, the good thing here is that um, we're seeing an increase uh, in the number of uh, people uh, of Libyans that were displaced in their own country, able to return to their uh, to the communities where they are from. Uh, and uh, you can see that basically that green line is the number of people that are able to return or that have returned. The blue line below is the number of people that um, were displaced. And you can see that um, this very much, these trends very much uh, coincide um, with uh, conflict or lack of conflict. So if when we have, uh, you know, at the end of uh, 2019, the beginning of 2020, where we had very, uh, well, most intense conflict uh, in some parts of the country, we see the trend of the uh, of the um, displaced persons increasing, and then in around mid 2020, when uh, the situation started to improve, eventually the ceasefire was signed uh, last fall. Uh, we see that um, the two lines go in opposite directions, meaning that um, fewer and fewer people are displaced, and more and more are returning to their homes. Um, it's a it's a little bit of an unusual situation of internal displacement in Libya because uh, we don't have camps. Uh, most people are displaced uh, with uh, in other homes, either with extended family, relatives, friends, <clears throat> and so um, you know it's not uh, it's not the kind of uh, IDP uh, image that uh, maybe some people have of, of uh, desolate people living in, uh, in camps. Uh, there are no camps uh, in the country, uh, but nonetheless, 
uh, you know, a lot of these uh, IDPs or returnees are going are uh, from communities that have been uh, seriously damaged by the conflict, or going back to areas that have sustained a lot of damage, and and will need support in uh, being able in 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 returning and 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 being able to restart their their uh, their lives where they're returning to. Next slide, please. Now, um, I'll just spend a few minutes on uh, IOM in Libya um, and just uh, describe a little bit what our approach is with respect to uh, a number of different, uh, very important uh, migration issues. Issues. Um, we are uh, the, the biggest uh, operational agency on the ground uh, of the, within the UN system. Uh, we have a long history of work in Libya. We, we've been there since 2006. And uh, currently uh, have just over 500 staff uh, throughout the country. Um, we're able really to reach um, even the most uh, difficult areas, even the most isolated areas, and um, in, which are primarily in the south. Um, and um, you can see uh, just, uh, you know, on the slide there um, that it really is a national, uh, a national footprint. Next slide, please. So um, we have um, earlier this year we um, we launched our uh, strategic objective objectives for two thousand twenty one to two thousand uh, and twenty four, uh, and these strategic objectives are. Um, they're uh, obviously aligned with uh, the internal uh, global uh, IOM uh, strategy as well as, as the regional one, uh, tailored to uh, the, Libyan, uh, the Libyan context. I'm not going to get uh, into too much detail uh, uh, of, on the strategy, but um, uh, what I wanted to uh, convey to you is that we basically uh, have... A situation in the country right now where um, there are still um, very uh, important and acute um, humanitarian needs um, in relation to um, not just uh, what's been what I've described already the search and rescue activities and then the the work that um, the the assistance that we're providing uh, in the detention centers. But also uh, in the communities as well, there are pockets of uh, very high risk and uh, very high vulnerability for uh, for migrants. Um, so there's an important um, humanitarian uh, element to our programming that um, has been there for many years, of course, uh, through throughout the throughout the conflict and, and through basically since 2011. Uh, for many years, that was. Uh, the main uh, the main uh, programming area, but now uh, with an improving situation, and specifically since last year, um, we've been able to uh, start to look at uh, much more, let's say, sustainable uh, or durable uh, programming and, and and solutions that look at uh, at governance. Uh, of migration and, and uh, of migration uh, management, um, because clearly, I mean, the humanitarian assistance is necessary, but um, it is not a solution. It's just a temporary fix. It's uh, it's assisting people who uh, who need uh, life uh, saving assistance in some cases at that moment, uh, but it's we're not we're not going forward with how uh, migration is managed uh, or governed. So um, right now, um, we have uh, over the last uh, basically 12 to 18 months uh, developed important areas of programming with the Libyan authorities on border management uh, and security, on, uh, on labor migration. Some, some good progress is, uh, is being made uh, on uh, health, which has been really scaled up because of the pandemic, but we were already doing uh, and we are continuing to do also work on uh, other communicable diseases and uh, in particular on uh, on uh, tuberculosis. 
Um, and uh, we have uh, basically a, a range of um, capacity enhancement uh, activities, legislative review, legislative support uh, to the Libyan authorities to uh, try and improve uh, migration, uh, migration management and migration governance uh and uh you know protection of uh of people of migrants uh in libya um it is um it is a context as i described where um there is uh, a, a labor market that relies on uh labor migrants and um one of my one of the concerns is that um while the, that number of migrants has uh, decreased uh over the last 10 years uh it is uh inevitable that it will increase um uh, as the situation improves politically and economically and and uh and the uh economy picks up uh picks up uh, speed and so um if we don't have good systems in place uh to deal with uh, those economic needs those economic realities uh, there is a risk that uh, the migrants will nonetheless uh, return, move to Libya for work opportunities, which they will find. Uh, and uh, we'll have, a, a, an, again, an, an increasing number of uh, migrants in an irregular uh, status. So really what we're working towards is legal, orderly and, uh, and safe migration in a way that uh, and, and, and trying to build systems to, um, that will help um, that will help the, st the state achieve that. Next slide, please. Um, just very quickly, um, some of our main uh, points uh, in the strategy are, of course, the, the government ownership, um, the evidence-based uh, programming, where uh, we're relying very, very heavily on, uh, on uh, a very good knowledge of uh, the situation in the country that uh, IOM has developed uh, over over the years with respect to migration issues. It is an integrated approach. Uh, we want to deliver uh, holistically, you know, and what I mean by that is that there isn't one solution to this, uh, to these, uh, to these, uh, this phenomenon or to these trends. You know, the solution isn't just to send everybody home or to seal up the border or, uh, you know, to let everybody uh, through. Um, the solution is uh, to use many different tools uh, together, uh, which include return, which include border security, which include safe and legal channels uh, uh, that uh, help satisfy the, the, the needs of the private sector for, for workers. And so um, that's what uh, we mean by an integrated approach. Um, and we also have some very interesting, um, they're just starting out these initiatives, but some very interesting uh, initiatives with the private sector as well, because uh, ultimately the private sector is uh, an important beneficiary of, uh, of the migrant labor force. And, um, you know, whenever we can find um, private sector companies that are, rec that are, willing to recognize this and, and work with us, we do that. And uh, we're doing some interesting things in that regard as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is, I think I've already uh, covered this slide, but uh, basically it's two track, uh, two track programming, the response to immediate needs, humanitarian uh, portfolio. And um, the other track, more on uh, migration governance, more that I would say the midterm to long term portfolio. Unfortunately, the situation is also is still very fragile in Libya, um, and so uh, we have to be ready also with the humanitarian uh, program to be able to scale up uh, quickly in the event that uh, uh, instability returns or or, or fighting uh, breaks out again. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, really an internal slide, but um, most important uh, piece in it um, is um, the one on innovation. Well, it's not a coincidence that it's the biggest one. Um, we have to keep, uh, it's a very fluid context in the country. Migration flows uh, 
are uh, very fluid. The phenomenon is, is constantly changing. And all of these things mean that uh, we have to be uh, innovative with our responses and that we have to be ready to adapt to a changing environment. And, um, you know, every environment is changing, but uh, I have, uh, I've been in Libya now for two years and uh, I've seen uh, probably three or four different uh, Libyas in terms of how quickly uh, things uh, can change. They're all complicated. They're all difficult to understand. And uh, it's really important that um, the programming that is developed is both realistic, but also uh, innovative and ready to adapt. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> this is just a brief summary of uh, a lot of what I've said already. Um, basically, the, a lot of our governance work is based on uh, improving uh, uh, the uh, community resilience and also on community stabilization and, and community engagement with Libyan communities, uh, which is uh, also part of um, the, the continuing the the the, the um, peace building uh, process. Um, we are uh, we are promoting the we are promoting uh, migration governance through uh, the different types of capacity building in interventions that I mentioned, and then uh, I think very importantly uh, we need to recognize uh, that. Um, you know, there, there are uh, important elements uh, uh, of labor of labor migration to uh, the Libyan uh, the Libyan uh, economy and, and to the Libyan labor market, and uh, you know trying to find that balance uh, between uh, openness uh, and uh, security uh, in order to try and, and harness that. Next slide, please. That's um, that's the end of my presentation, and I I tried to provide you in uh, in the time that I had with uh, a fairly comprehensive overview of uh, of not just the situation but how we are uh, we are responding. And I thank you very much for uh, for your attention.